Welcome to Precious Testimonies. I'm Norm Rasmussen. It's a privilege and an honor to bring another broadcast into the homes of people across the country. You know, it is an incredible privilege to give God glory for what he's done in the lives of ourselves and others. Perhaps you're not aware that in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, one of the more popular books of the Old Testament, uh, chapter 96, verse 3, it reads, Declare God's glory among the nations. Declare God's glory among the nations. Well, God has given us marching orders to do just that. Declare his glory. And he has fine-tuned his will for our lives uh, to simply set up a camera and uh, come into the homes of those who uh, are uh, looking for ways to glorify their Lord, their Savior, their God. And, and we do this as an uh, opportunity to give others a platform to give their God glory for what He has done in their lives. And uh, so we're going to be listening to a special couple sharing how God has worked in their life, and it's going to be a blessing to hear how God has done that. However, we are aware that many people flipping channels uh, stop at uh, the broadcast uh, of precious testimonies and they want to hear what others have to say about this God because we know that God has a high number of people watching the broadcasts that we're privileged to produce who aren't even sure there is a God. They're not really sure that God exists. And that's okay. You see, because there was a time, even in my own life, when I didn't believe there was a God. I didn't think there was a God for 35 years, to be honest with you. And in a moment of time, God in his mercy made himself real to me. That was over 16 years ago as of this taping. If you're in that category where if you would be honest, you're not sure that God even exists. Or if you pray a prayer and you're not sure there's a God who even hears that prayer, let alone cares about hearing your prayer. I would encourage you strongly to take the time and listen to what's going to be shared with you on this broadcast. You see, we spend a great deal of time praying and trusting the creator of the universe to use what we say for the spirit of the living God, this one called the Holy Spirit, to impart something special to those who watch these broadcasts. So we have every reason to believe that God has something that he wants you to hear on this broadcast. That it's not a coincidence that you are watching it, and it will not be a coincidence that when it's done, you're going to be able to say, hmm, I think God might have said something through those individuals that I needed to hear. Friend, expect it to happen. That's not super spiritual. The Holy Spirit speaks through normal human beings. And we have to be in tune. We have to sort of have our inner ears perked up. Because God surely wants to speak to you as loudly and as clearly in your inner being, in your spirit person, as he has spoken to anybody else ever. He truly wants to you to be able to hear him speak to you. No, it may never be audibly, but he will speak to your spirit. And what a better time than now to learn how to hear what God wants to speak, wants to impart, wants you to have understanding, revelation, knowledge, insight, whatever it is. Expect God to have something just for you on this broadcast so that you can come one step closer to believing there is a God or if you believe there is a God you can come one step closer to having a relationship with God because God desires a personal relationship with him 
He truly does. We're going to turn it over now to a special friend of mine by the name of Dan Van Hoven. Dan Van Hoven has been privileged uh, to be led of God to become friends with the couple that's going to be sharing, and Dan is a close friend of mine. Uh, I just love this brother dearly, and he's been the one responsible for um, bringing this couple forward to where they can share on camera, and so we're going to turn it over to him. God has given him some things to say for someone watching this broadcast, perhaps for you, and then when he's done, he'll turn it over to uh, Moses and Diane. So with that, let's now listen to what God has for you. Hello, how you doing today? Uh, my name is Dan Van Hoven, as uh, Norm so graciously uh, welcomed me to do this today. And I uh, have a few things that the Lord has laid on my heart to uh, say to you today. And uh, it's a privilege to be able to do this little introduction here for Moses and Diane uh, Alexander, uh, two people that I have uh, great respect for. And uh, I just have a few things that I'd like to say about God's love about God's mercy and uh, hopefully an understanding that a little bit and that if you're not a Christian or if you are a struggling Christian that uh, maybe we have something to say to you today to speak to your heart and uh, I would just like to say a little prayer first that uh, God would give me the words to say as I am speaking to you that uh, he might tailor make those words to speak to your heart Heavenly Father, I just pray, dear Lord, that you would give me the words to say, O oh Lord, that would be tailor-made to touch the hearts uh, out there, O oh Lord. There's so many different circumstances that we can find ourselves in, O oh Lord. May you speak to that heart, O oh Lord, that needs you in a special way today, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And uh, the very first thing I would like to do today is uh, share to you, share with you the story of the prodigal son. And uh, that's just one of the most special stories in the Bible. And uh, really, uh, the story of God's mercy and love toward his people and how that is portrayed through this story. And uh, if you have a Bible in your home, I'd like you to go grab that and get it because uh, I'd like you to follow along and read with me now from Luke 15, 11. Uh, through the end of the chapter and uh, we'll be making several references today to uh, God's Word and I think it would be really beneficial if you were to go get a Bible and, and read along with us as uh, I'm sure Moses and Diane will be referring a lot of times to the Bible too. Uh, so here we start the story of the prodigal son. Then Jesus said, there was a young man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property and all that he, and, and dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he sent off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, 
and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his son of yours, but when the son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, who killed the fatted calf. You killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And that story just says so much about God's love. And really the entire Bible is, is about that. About that story of the prodigal son who uh, not so unlike myself in my life and uh, I think too in Moses and Diane's life. They had to go through some experience um, because we're so stubborn by nature. We have to go through our own experience to really know the love of God. But I consider the prodigal son, the blessed son, really, because it was him that was aware of his great need for God's love. And of course, we have that love through Jesus Christ alone. Jesus Christ's death on the cross alone can save us. And until I realize that, or until any of you realize that, you're lost and you're caught up in your own pride your own ignorance, your own selfishness, until you realize that you can't do it yourself and that Christ living through you is the only way to salvation to make it. But I consider him the blessed brother, like I was saying, because his elder brother, the self-righteous brother, didn't realize his need for his God's love. He was jealous. And, and dear brothers and sisters out there, uh, our churches are literally filled with older brothers who are jealous, who are self-righteous, who don't see the real need for Jesus Christ. We should be so busy in our churches celebrating what Jesus Christ has done for us through the great love of God that we're not so busy caught up with these little arguments about minor issues. We should be so caught up in worship and praise that we're not majoring on minors like we are in the church. And that's the greatest shame that uh, is on upon the church today is that self-righteous spirit that is there that people are so caught up in disputable matters that they're not focused on the love of Jesus Christ. But that's something that you're not going to hear here today. I hope and I pray that you will just know of God's love. He loves you no matter what you've done, no matter anything that has happened in your past. God loves you and He forgives you. The whole Bible, the pinnacle of the Bible, is pointed to the love of God through Jesus Christ. And if we miss that, we might as well stay home from church because that is the whole point of the Bible. And let us go from there. Let us go from God's love through Jesus Christ and just live a life in appreciation and flowing appreciation of gratitude for the love of God poured out through Jesus Christ. And uh, we as Christians, we know the story of uh, the Trinity. Uh, that's a little confusing 
uh, to, especially to new believers. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But what really happened on Calvary was God coming down in the flesh. God Himself in the flesh was Jesus Christ, the perfect man, the only one that could do it. He related to all of our problems. He came here in the flesh, and He loved us so much. Every person on earth, I don't care what you've done, God can forgive you. The blood poured out on Calvary can forgive you. And if you don't believe that, you're believing Satan's lie. For Satan is a, a, called the accuser of the brethren who will accuse you and make you feel guilty. God can forgive everything. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, you are saved. Believe that. And may you just turn your life around today and live a life of appreciation the rest of your life here on earth for God, God Almighty, who came to earth in the flesh as Jesus Christ and now wants to live in your heart as the Holy Spirit. Accept that. I don't care what you have done. I don't care what another church is telling you, what your parents might have told you. We are so performance orientated, but God isn't. He doesn't care what we have done. He wants us to repent of our sins, yes, but to move on and to accept His grace. So I hope that you can do that in this day. And I, I just want to say more about the, the, the prodigal son now. The prodigal son. We say, well, how could this happen to someone like Billy Graham's son? Billy and Ruth Graham have a son named Franklin. And uh, we think, how can this great evangelist, this man that uh, has worked for God all his life, how can his son get caught up in being a prodigal? I mean, Billy and Ruth must have been praying for this child from the time that before he was born. How could this happen? Well, I think the Bible tells us how that can happen. Uh, number one, we are prideful. And uh, that is just something that is innate in all of us. We are proud. We are proud people. We think we can do it on our own. But there is also something else out there. And uh, that something else out there is an enemy that we have. An enemy of Jesus Christ. And uh, when we look in our Bibles in 2 Corinthians 2.11, uh, we read that we shouldn't be ignorant, unaware of the devil's tricks. Because the devil's got a bunch of tricks and he's constantly playing mind games with us. He wants to make you feel guilty. He wants to make you feel worthless. He wants to separate you from God. He wants to make you feel self-righteous, making you feel like you don't need God. And we have to constantly be on guard of that. And we also know in John 8, 44, uh, here's, what, here's what Jesus says about uh, the people that haven't accepted Him as their Savior and Lord. He says to these people, You are from the Father, the devil, and you chose to do your Father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because the truth, there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is constantly trying to get in between our relationship with, with God and ourselves. And uh, there's no truth in him. He's full of lies. And he's very good at lying. So we have to understand that just because we may feel something or think something logically in our heads, it's probably a lie from Satan. And we have to constantly be praying in the name of Jesus Christ to God to help us to protect us from Satan. He wants to come in every day and try and deceive us, bring some deception in our life. So we know that uh, it's possible for, for a man of uh, Billy Graham and uh, Ruth Graham's uh, integrity to have a son like Franklin who was led astray by the devil because God has no grandchildren. That is to say, each one of us have to make a decision whether we're going to believe in Jesus Christ for ourselves. Our parents' merit don't save us. Just because we were raised in a Christian home, as I was, 
and I had to fall flat on my face before I realized the love of God. I had all that knowledge, but I had no heart knowledge. And most Christians are about 12 inches away from their head to their heart from being saved. They got all the knowledge, but it's not in their heart. They have no real gratitude toward God for what He's done for them because it just doesn't click with them. And really, in a way, I think that prodigals are blessed because they can see their great error so plainly. God makes it so clear to us. And uh, I'm certainly not suggesting a, a lifestyle apart from God. I'm not suggesting that at all. But uh, if you have lived a fairly good life, you think, and uh, a religious life, please don't be deceived into thinking that you did it on your own. In fact, get down on your knees right now and repent before God and ask Him to do a mighty work in your life through Jesus Christ. Ask Him to do something in your heart that's just not there because you don't have that hunger to serve Him because He hasn't made it plain to you how sinful you really are. In Jeremiah 17 we read that there is nothing more wicked and deceitful than the human heart. So we have the devil and we have a human heart that's wicked. And we need Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation. And a little more on the salvation thing. We have, as Christians, uh, have to glory in the cross alone. Alone in the cross can we be uh, saved. And I want to read to you some things that uh, uh, are kind of what God's trying to tell us about uh, our faith, about uh, what He has done through His Son, Jesus Christ. In our performance-based world, in a world where we're graded for everything we do, uh, we're winners and losers in our eyes. And uh, But here's what God did. I'm going to read from uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to the end of the chapter. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are so, then no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of our life in, G in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God did it all through Jesus Christ. In order that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Boast in the Lord only. And we can so easily get caught up in the trap of saying, me this, me that, I did this, I did that. God is saying, I don't care what college you graduated from. I don't care if you have your doctor's degree. That doesn't matter to God. God is not impressed by that. Although He may have blessed you with uh, great intelligence, that's okay. But do not glory in that. Do not give yourself credit for that. All the glory goes to God for everything. All the glory goes to God through Jesus Christ. And I'd also like to read from uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and uh, read through till verse 20. And let this speak to your heart directly. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God temp God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves if you think that you are wise in this age. You should become fools so that you may become wise. You should get down on your knees so God can work in your life. You should break that spirit of pride in your life so Jesus Christ can come into your life because He won't until you know how, uh, how foolish you are. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. 
And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. God knows that they come to nothing. God created you, and He can save you too, if you allow Him to. God doesn't send anyone to hell. He allows you to make a choice. And uh, with ending with that, I would just like to uh, introduce to you some of the finest Christians uh, I have met in my life here on earth. Uh, dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, the love of Christ just flows from them. Uh, the joy of the Lord is in them. And uh, I've, I met Moses a little over a year ago at a Promise Keeper Leadership Seminar. Or excuse me, it wasn't quite a year ago. And uh, he has just been a real inspiration, a real blessing to me. Uh, such strong faith, such strong commitment. And uh, I just would pray again that uh, God would really work in your heart as Moses and Diane uh, share their stories. And I pray that in this day that God's love would break into your heart through Jesus Christ. Thank you. Hello out there. My name is Moses Alexander, and uh, I'm just grateful to be here uh, this morning. I, I thank God for just waking me in my right mind. I've come to uh, just tell you some things of my life and how Jesus Christ came into my heart and where I come from. And I pray that this would be a blessing to somebody that done what I've done and and wouldn't have to do because of this testimony. This testimony is to glorify and give God the glory. This is what this testimony is about. This is not about me or anything else. And I just thank God for understanding that it was because He is, I am. And I'm just grateful to know that. Uh, giving honor to God again. I thank God for my brother Dan who just came on and gave me an introduction there. You know, <laughs> I think supersedes anything that I've ever done. But I thank God for him, you know, for coming into my life. And I thank God that we, uh, that, that he gives us a heart to know that uh, there's no big eyes and no small me's. Uh, we all the same in Christ. So what, you know, what I've shared in the Dan's life, uh, he's shared the same thing in my life. And I thank God for understanding that, that, there, that there's no one greater than the other in the body of Christ. And I just praise God for that brother, and I pray for our relationship and strength to continue in Christ because he's been a blessing to me. Amen. Now I just want to um, let you know who I am and where I've come from. Uh, again, my name is Moses, and I'm a recovered drug addict. So if you're out there in uh, a 12 and 12 program and you are still continuing to believe that you are recovering and not have recovered, I've come to tell you that Jesus Christ can heal you and deliver you so that you can be recovered such as I am. A lot of people thought I was, uh, you know, a little insane when I said that I was recovered and really not knowing in the beginning why I said it because I, I didn't use drugs as continuous as I did when I uh, w was using drugs. So when I came into a program, a 12 and 12 program, um, you know, I start feeling the sense of being delivered, not really understanding, you know, what was going on. But I felt that if I'm not using, uh, and then I'm recovered. You know, it's just like having cancer. If you get healed, you're not in a continuously recovering mode. You've been healed so that means you've been recovered uh, I just want to read a verse of scripture that would solidify that what I just said and that's in first Peter 2 24 and it said who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live until righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed that tells me that I'm healed because we had a God that went to the cross and died for our sins and took the sins of not just me but the whole world, not just saved people either, mind you. The Bible says in John 3, 16 that God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that we might have a right to eternity. And that's what that scripture says. So not just because I'm saved that this is for me, this is for those that are still in sin and seeking someone to come into their heart. Amen. But I want to tell you about some of the things that occurred in my life as I lived being a drug addict. Just to 
just to, to, to show you the glory of God and what he's done for me. Uh, I remember when I first started out in addiction that um, I thought that was a way of life. I thought that was the, the only thing that I can do because I had heard the rumor that once an addict, always an addict. So, you know, if you hear something long enough, you, you tend to believe that to be the truth. And I, and I believed that for a long time. So I continued in a path of such destruction that was profoundly insane profoundly insane I mean uniquely insane to believe that there was no hope for me because I didn't know who Jesus Christ was so I you know I, I heard the enemy talking to me and telling me that you know this is it you know this is the way you're gonna live forever and you know I was so beaten bound that I accepted that and believed it and believed that and went into a mode of living that I have a wife and four children and uh, that robbed me of all that young, that, that, that youthfulness of my elder children. I never had an opportunity to be a father uh, to them because I thought getting high was more important. I never had an opportunity to be a husband to my wife because I thought she was an adult and able to, uh, to, to provide for herself and just care for herself. And, and we have a big problem with that in this country today with men not being responsible, not being able to, to accept the, the personal responsibilities that we put upon ourselves as uh, our children's and wife and just our commitment to other people. Uh, men have a problem with that and I'm not going to go through the statistics but there are more single female families in this country than there is men in a home and it ought not to be like that but that's how it was and, and, and I played a part in that too. And I, I helped that statistic, um, but God has blessed me to, to see that he has called me into his own light. He's called me into his own image. As I begin to study the Bible in Genesis 126, when I read that in the Bible, that God said, let us make man in our own image. Uh, you know, that just, just blew my mind to think that God thought that a, a, a wretch like me was worthy to, to be made into his own image. And, and it, just, it just took a profound uh, a thing in my mind. I didn't understand that. And, and, and I don't know if I truly understand that now. But he has called me from the depths of addiction. He's called me from the gutter. And that's where I, I've been. Amen. And uh, the Lord... Um, uh, has, has called me to a place where, 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 where I understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And I just thank God for that. But again, robbing uh, the people in my life. My ch I, I, you know, drugs took from me that can never be restored. Uh, you know, and that's time that's already been passed away. And there's nothing I can do about that. Uh, that's happened. And, you know, and I just pray to God that I, you know, that I be a better person in Christ than I was in my addiction but I just didn't have the time to 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 give love because because I didn't understand what love was I was in a world where he was a dog eat dog you know every man for himself do what you have to do to make it out and that for me was to get high so whatever it took that's what I had to do and certainly being responsible to my wife and to my family that was just that was that was secondary didn't really mean a lot didn't understand it because I had made a decision to be that drug addict what society said that I would be because I was and so I just took that route and I lived that life for a long time and I thank God for my wife I thank God that she stuck by me uh, in the times when you know it would have just been sane to say hey let's give up there's no hope here you know this this is this this brother is through he's he's finished but the Bible teaches us and we thank God for a uh, uh, Bible believing people who know that as long as there's life in somebody's body there's hope for them if you still have life in your body there's always hope for you never be dispelled by any rumors because that's what they are when they say there's no hope for a person uh, I serve a God that would go down and a uh, God so great that he would go and meet any of us on whatever level we at. Glory to God. Is we don't have to be a college graduate. We don't have to be uh, an executive of a plant. We don't have to be, we can be a nobody like me. <laughs> 
We can be a nobody like me and God can take a nobody like me to tell anybody that somebody saves and that's Jesus Christ. And if he can do that for me, glory to God, a guy that was just prone to be uh, in the abandoned building, just prone and, and accepted a way of life of despair. If he can take a guy like me, he can take any drug addict out there and change him and turn him around. Any prostitute, he can take him and change him and turn him around. He's done that for me, and he is mighty and faithful. The Bible says he's faithful to the end, and he'll do all that that he said he would do. And he said if we call on him, he would give, deliver us. He would give us salvation. He would give us an opportunity to eternity. He said that, and he proved that by sending his only begotten son. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. And he did that for, for me. And But I just thank God for the people who prayed for me. It was a lot of people who prayed for me. And particularly, uh, I, didn't I wasn't raised in a family where uh, my parents were God-filled. You know, but they had a desire that we know God. They had a desire that we go to Sunday school. But from everything I can remember, they didn't have that burning desire to, to, to teach us you know, all the ways of the Lord. So I'm at a disadvantage by not having that teaching and we are putting our children at a disadvantage if we do not know who Christ is. The Bible says we ought to rear our children in the way of the Lord. And I didn't have that opportunity. So it, it you know, not making any excuses for what I've done, not blaming my past for what I've done, it's what happened. But I know that it makes a difference that now that I'm in Christ and I have younger children, they will have an opportunity to know who the Lord is because I'm taking the time to, to teach them the way of the Lord to the best of my ability. I'm not a perfect teacher. I'm not nowhere near in that realm. But I know if I strive to do what the Lord called me to do, He will bless my efforts. All I have to do is show up and have a desire. For the Bible says that God will give us the desires of our hearts. And if my desires is that my children be raised in a godly way and that I be that example, me and my wife as a husband and wife, then God is going to bless that. All I have to do is show up. And I, and I just thank God for how he's blessed us with another child that's only two years old. Because I believe that uh, I have a 23-year-old, a 20-year-old, 11-year-old, and a 2-year-old. All the way to 11, 12, I really didn't play a big part in their life. In fact, the 23-year-old and the 20-year-old, you know, I was just there. And they knew that I was their father because their mother told them. And I can remember times coming home from work and my children um, would be outside playing and they would like go and hide because I was drunk and my eyes was red and they were really ashamed of me being their father because I had no purpose if you will and so that made the children not really have any real respect for me so I really couldn't have taught them anything because I wasn't in a position anyway but praise be to God that God came along in my time of a 12 and 12 program. I said I went through the 12 and 12 program and I stayed there for a while. And, and I knew that the Lord had called me and I thank God for Narcotics Anonymous because that was my springboard to get into, into Jesus Christ. Because I made the meetings, I did all the things that were required. But I still had this tremendous void in me that I just didn't know what it was. I just knew that I had gotten all. If you take something for something that does not for me have a Christ center I can take everything out of that and, ex and absorb that to its extent and just use it all up. But I found that in Christ, there's no limit to what he can do. The Bible says it's as the sands on the seashore. He has that many blessings for, for each and every one of us. So that tells me that's a resource that's going to be here, now, forever, and when I'm gone. For the, for the Bible says that the word of God will always be here. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will always be here. So that tells me that there's a resource in that that I cannot absorb. There's, there's, you know, there's no bounds to what God can do. There's no uh, end to what he can do in my life if I yield to that spirit. Praise God. But getting back to Narcotics Anonymous, when I, when I came into that program, I, I stayed there for as long as I could. And I learned a, a few things in that program that when you stay there too long, you will repeat the same thing again. You know, insanity is 
doing the same thing continuously and expecting something different. Doing the same, getting high every day and expecting it's going to change, but you getting high, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. It's not going to happen. If we're doing the same thing, we, gonna, we should expect that to come, which we do. And that's just how it is. And if we stay, if I stayed in a place too long, I, I, I felt that it was an opportunity for me to repeat. So I had an opportunity to find the Lord. No, excuse me. The Lord found me, <laughs> for he wasn't lost. I was lost. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank God for that. Thank God I was the one that was lost and not him, because we wouldn't have no way if he would ever be lost. And we know that he's the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. So he's not lost. I take that back. Amen. He found me. Thank God for that. Glory to God. And uh, I thank God for praying people, because... Uh, there's, there's a song out, somebody pray for me. I know somebody had to pray for me because there was no way in this life that I should be here today in the presence of, of people that take time to come and, and to just to do things like this at no cost. I mean, just come that the word of God will be glorified. The purpose of this ministry is that the word of God gets out and let people know that Jesus Christ died for their sins and he loves us and he want to see us all saved. That's the purpose of this ministry as I understand it. And I thank God for them. But I can remember years ago, people that are here now would, would have absolutely nothing to do with me. Rightfully so. Because, you know, I was... A drug addict. I, I, I was a thief. I was a liar. I was all them things. And it's just a blessing for a brother like Dan to give me an introduction. I just want to make sure that you know who I am and where I came from. You know, a drug addict, a liar, a thief, and all the other things that associate itself with drug addiction. And I have friends today in Christ that pray for me, that are willing to take time to listen to me, to encourage me, to you know, to esteem me. And I just thank God for that. I thank God for this ministry again. But years ago, they wouldn't have wanted to been bothered with me because you know I put myself in a position to say it's over. And but it, and we never know when it's over. You know, suicide. Uh, you know, uh, you know, as a trick of the devil. You know, we've come to a place where we say it's over, but God is the creator of all things. He is the beginning and the end. That means he created us, and when his time has come, the end will be for us. For we've come in this life but for a moment, but to make no decisions on when we come and go. Because the Bible clearly states that he made everything in the beginning, and at the end, it was over. So I believe that was Jesus. I believe that's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who makes that decision when, you know, when it's over. Amen. Praise God. But uh, being an addict, it, it learned me a lot. It, it taught me a lot about how to survive. And I take that same concept without using nothing but the Word of God, and you apply that in my life today, that I'll be a blessing to the Lord. As I was to the devil, because I was working, I was, I was, I was recruiting for the devil. I was, you know, telling people, you know, you know, getting high is it. And today, I'm telling people that Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And I just thank God for that, for that, for that tremendous 360. The God went into the murk and mire and pulled me out. He delivered me from jails. He delivered me from, from everything that I was bound up in. And I don't have to live like I lived uh, just a few years ago. I don't have to accept things for the way they are. I can go to my God in prayer, and he says he will answer our prayer. Anything that we ask in his name will be given unto us. And he said we should not ask to miss. When I go and pray, I go letting God know this is what I want, and, and this is what your word say should happen. You said you would give us prosperity and abundance. I claim it, I believe it because the word of God said. And I believe that when we talk the word of God back to God, he cannot, he cannot turn his back on his word. He said he will deliver us. And Acts 1631 gave me a blessed assurance when he said that if I'm saved, my house will be saved. Not being that they will come under my salvation, that if I just be faithful and believe that God will be able to change the hearts of the people in this house that are not saved. And we have a 23-year-old boy that's not saved right now. And we just believe God through prayer 
and being faithful that he will change that situation around. And that's what I believe. And he said it in his word. And I pray that to him every day. You said, if I'm saving, Lord, I'm here to do what you've called me to do. Lord, I'm here to do the things that you put me in place to do. And I will be obedient. And I know that, you know, maybe not my time because the Bible says our time is not his time. And I thank God for that. Thanking God for praying people. It's been people in my life that's prayed for me when I was in addiction that never gave up for me that would come to see you know how I was and um, amen, amen. I, I just get emotional when I think about what God did for me and um, it's, it's just good to know that we serve a God that will meet us wherever we at and you know if we just might be the worst people uh, we think that if, if we think that um, um, if we just believe that God will be able to change us and I just thank God for all the people and some of the people have passed away Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. I thanks for strength. Amen. And, um, you know, some of the people had passed away, but a lot of people cared for me and prayed for me and seen that I had um, the things I needed. And uh, they just prayed for me. And, uh, you know, and I didn't come this far by myself. It was through the prayers of righteous people. And it was through God honoring their prayers that I was able to uh, not be high today, uh, not be willing to... Um, uh, just take things from my home to sell to you know for my own self amen and I just thank God for all the people that pray for me and particularly uh, a, a woman pastor who um, uh, laid the foundation of Christ you know the spirit through her laid the foundation for me to uh, to, to, to be um, just what I am It's through God's grace that I am what I am and I just thank God for her obedience to, to Christ not to think I was less than and, and took the time to pray with me and to just to teach me the things of the Bible. And I thank God for, that's, that's my pastor in New Jersey. And she's just been a blessing to me. And I just thank God for that, for that whole church family because they, through it all, you know, they were there. They, they seemed to, to, to whatever my needs spiritually and, and everything. And I just thank God for that. Glory to God. Amen. And it's just a blessing to know that we, we serve a God that is, was, is able to do tremendous things, great things, awesome things. God is just awesome. And, and I just know from my own experience, from where I come from, and um, he's, just been, he's just been awesome to me. And, and, and he's provided me with uh, a job. He's provided me with, um, you know, relationships. He's provided me with, you know, commitment that I never thought was ever possible. I never thought that I would be able to... Uh, uh, to, to just be committed to anything because I just know uh, you know I was just a liar and so and I, I was I raised up like that for so long it just became a way of life but God has turned that around I can I can make commitments to people and keep them you know and and mostly to God that's that's who I, I like to make my commitments to that I'll be used any way the Lord will have me to be used I'll go wherever he want me to go and I'll do exactly what he want me to do to the best of my ability and I just pray that I continue to be obedient but it was in 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 my third year of recovery that I, I had the, the 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 Christ experience that when the Lord just came into my heart I, I was in a hospital uh, I had uh, I had stopped using drugs for about four years, and I had you know stopped fighting with my wife. I had stopped you know doing all the things contrary to what I was doing, and I started trying to be a father in my own right without no help from the Lord, and being a husband and being productive. I did all them things, and I thought I had to work for 60, 70, 80 hours a week, and I proceeded to do that, and I got so much money. I made so much money. Uh, but the more money I made, the less I had. I couldn't figure it out. I mean, I was, you know, I was, I, I, I couldn't figure it out. But I, that void was still there, and I didn't know what it was, and I had got sick. The Lord had, um, I, I believe, had his hand and just slowing me down so that he can talk to me so I can hear him. And if, you know, if you didn't stop me and set me down, you, you know, you said things, because people said things to me in passing that just, did, you know, made sense, but I just didn't have time. You know, you know, you need to come to know the Lord. Yeah, I will. You know, I'm not ready right now. So, you know, I'm on the move. So I, I don't have time for things like that. And I just thank God that how he worked in my life in, in that hospital in Willingboro, New Jersey. 
that um, I was in the hospital for 12 days and um, uh, and um, you know it was you know and I wasn't ready to, to submit myself to the Lord and uh, that's just how it was because I just thought money you know was um, the essence of everything you know if you ain't got money you ain't got nothing but you know you know as I come closer to the Lord I you know we need money but you know that shouldn't be my God and then I was I didn't understand that then so I was in the hospital for like 12 days and um, the, the doctors they couldn't find out what was wrong with me and um, you know, you know, in, in the in the midnight hour, you know, when nobody would be in the hospital room but me and and the, and, the, and the Lord, and I knew it was Him, because we would have conversation, and I would tell Him, I say, Lord, uh, I've done. I stopped using drugs, and you know, I, you know, me and my wife don't fight no more. I take a little bit of time with the children, as opposed to not doing anything, and I and I'm doing that now. And uh, you know, you know, what 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 do you want from me? You know, and he was telling me that I hadn't surrendered my all, and 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 I fought the Lord, and the doctors would come in, and that was in 1991, and the doctors would come in and they would say, you know, well we can't find out what's wrong, and um, and, and naturally, uh, being an IV drug user, you know, I just had to think the worst. I thought I had uh, contracted the AIDS virus, but. You know, and so all them things was going through my mind. So, you know, when they couldn't find it, and, and, I, and I'm saying, like, this is 1991. <laughs> you know, this, this, there's things out there where they should be able to find out what was wrong with me. But it was that, that time, as, as I grew in Christ, it was that time of wrestling with the Lord. And when you wrestle with God, you, you ain't going to win. It's going to be the way He wanted it to be. No matter how you might think, whatever you might conceive, it's going to be the way that he wanted to be. And he has his ways of talking to each one of us the way he wants to. He, he might not talk to all of us the same, but he had his ways of getting through to us. And we would go back and forth and I, Lord, I, you know, I, I've done everything. He sent, the, uh, he sent the preachers, he sent all the people to pray with me. And I just wasn't ready for that because all I wanted to do, I wanted to continue to use profanity. I wanted to continue to use, uh, play the lottery. I wanted to continue to do just the other little things that didn't use, that, and just not use drugs. That's all I wanted to do. And uh, I, I, that, that's all I wanted to do is just, just stop that one thing. But the Lord had another plan for me, and my plan wasn't his plan. So he had to get my attention. So in that, in that room at night, we, we would talk, and, you know, and I was saying, Lord, like, you know, what's, what's, what's up? Why they can't find out what's wrong with me? They got all this stuff here. And he was saying, you know, I got to work for you. I I got something for you to do. I delivered you not to sit home, and we had acquired a nice home. Um, we we had we had acquired a lot of things through my hard work and my wife's hard work that we had acquired some nice things. The remote, and I was able to sit on the TV, go to work, come home, and look at TV. Get up and go to work, and come back and look at. And that was the extent of my life. And the Lord said, I did not call you from addiction. I did not call or deliver you from that to come here and sit on this couch to do that. And I, and I couldn't figure it out. So for eight days, I said to the Lord, you know, Lord, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing all what you told me to do. Stop using drugs. I stopped using drugs. So, you know, just let me have these little things to do. Let me have my little toys, my little, you know, say whatever I want, smoke my cigarettes. Let me do them things, Lord. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get high no more. And he said, no, I, I, I want you whole so that you can be um, effective unto me. And we just struggled with that. And so about on the eighth day, I had got tired, you know, because we have a God that never sleep nor slumber. I have to rest. So, and, and my body got weary, but the Lord was, he, he was overpowering me with his grace. And, and he's not making, the Lord don't make us do nothing we don't want to do. It's that grace. And if we yield to that spirit, we will have an opportunity of, 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 of a good life in Christ. And so on that eighth day, I had I had I had had enough. You know how they say sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was sick and tired of laying in that hospital. I was sick and tired of them not knowing what the problem was, and I just got scared. And on that eighth day, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if um, you 
Amen. It's, it's just an experience that I just had with the Lord, and it just touches me every time I talk about it. Amen. But um, on the eighth day, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if, you know, if they can find out what's wrong with me and, um, you know, tell me what's wrong with me and we come up with a diagnosis and, uh, you know, I'm yours. And after all that time, and on that ninth day, that morning, I went in for a test and um, they, they, they took the test and they came back within an hour and they told me exactly everything that was wrong with me <laughs> and exactly what it would take for me to, to, to function back regular. And so right then I knew that the Lord had touched my life and I knew the void that I had was fulfilled by Jesus Christ coming and ministering to me and I thank God that I yield to that spirit and I thank God that he was patient and faithful as his word said it would be. And it just, it was in no time that they came back and told me everything that was wrong with me and they said we can do this and do that and you can go home in two days. And I just knew that it was the Lord. And I just thank God for just saving me, for coming upon me, even in my times where it looked like it wasn't no hope for me, even in the times where it looked like it was the end was there, even in the times when I, just, a lot of friends, uh, people that I got high with, have died from AIDS, have died from uh, of doing robberies and things. I mean, friends that, people that I, I was close with, people that we, 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 we did things together with. And a lot of them are not here because they chose to continue in the path that they, that they were in. And I just thank the Lord for calling me and bringing me into his marvelous life. And I thank God the Father for, and we serve a triune God, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and God the Father who knitted me in my mother's womb, and God the Son who gave me eternal life. Praise God for that. And God the Holy Spirit who's given me the power to come overcome every obstacle through this Word of God that come up against me. And I just thank God that just for this for this day that I'm living the way he wants me to live I thank God that he gives me an opportunity to go out into the community from which that's what God delivered me from he didn't deliver me uh, like he said to sit and watch the TV and to just to have my own little thing and to smoke my cigarettes he delivered me to go out into the community to tell people that people like me are, are, are wretch good for nothing uh, in the gutter I'm, I'm a gutter that's why I, I stayed in abandoned buildings I don't stay in an abandoned building today. I have a shower. I can change clothes three times a day if I want to, but that's not what I'm trying to say. It's because I chose to accept Christ in my life. And I thank God for the 12 and 12 program, but it was Jesus Christ who brought me into that marvelous light to tell me that I don't have to be bound to nothing or nobody. Only keep my eyes on the cross, and that's where my deliverance is. And when I come out into the community, that's what I tell the people. And, and, and if for you have that are in the Grand Rapids area, if I haven't been to your community, look for me because I will be there. Because God has commissioned uh, the saints of God to go into the community and let people know that it was Jesus Christ's blood. That was the atonement for our sins, the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other atonement but the blood. If there is no blood, there is no atonement. There is no forgiveness. There is no sin bared in nobody's body. The, the cross says that atonement it was Jesus Christ, nothing else. So if I haven't been into your community... Pray with us that we will get there to let you know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And I just give honor to God for just raising me up and just taking me through the things that he took me through. And, and my life has not been easy, but, you know, uh, the Bible says, forget the things that are behind and reach for the things that are before us. And that's the prize that's in Christ Jesus. And so that's whatever I've done, I've done, and I can't change that. That's the way it was. But God still loved me in spite of what I'd done. And, you know, in my natural, and, the, and Brother Dan talked about the foolishness of, of the gospel. And if, if you think that saving a, a, a nobody, that's absolutely insane to a wise man. That's absolutely insane to him. That's, that's, they can't even understand that. But God came down right in the gutter and met me and pulled me out of there. And here I am today telling whoever would listen that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the light. And 
and 10 years ago this was unthinkable was wasn't even in the plan but i thank god for my wife i thank god that she stood by me i thank god that she continued to be saved and filled with the holy ghost and that together we do ministry and i thank god for that i, I just thank god for the relationship we don't have the perfect marriage but we are the bible says strive for it, and that's what we're doing we're striving for it, and and, and we're just going to continue to go in that way and we just thank god for this ministry we thank god for precious testimonies coming into our home and giving us the opportunity to share the gospel uh i don't know who this message might have helped uh but the lord put it on my heart to let you know that no matter who you are or where you are and if you think god can't meet you there try him try him see call on him and see what he say and for those that do not know the lord and thinking that well i need time to you know clean up and you know i i'm just not ready take no thought for tomorrow your time is right now and if you don't know who jesus christ is if you would pray this simple prayer with me you will come to know him in your hearts and that's where we need to meet Jesus Christ at in our heart as you said the brother uh, brother Dan said our hearts are above everything the most wicked and deceitful thing that is the absolute source of our sins and if we don't have a guard over it, Jesus Christ we will continue to act out in all those ways the adulterous ways those out of control ways those uh, the, all the ways that are contrary to the Word of God that's the that's the shield we need for our heart and that's Jesus Christ that's the only thing was gonna stop that's the only thing stopped me from doing all the things that comes into my mind because I know is what comes out of a man that defiles him not what goes in so when it come in and if I filter it out or if I just pray about it I have a chance of not acting on it but if I do not know Christ or if I don't believe what he said in his word I have a chance of that same thing happening to me so if we got Jesus Christ the shield of our heart we have a good opportunity not to do the things that we want to do and I'm not saying we always gonna do that but we have an opportunity to be consistent with not doing them so if you do not know who Jesus Christ is we're gonna give you an opportunity to pray with us and accept Christ into your heart. You can do it right there, right where you're at. God will meet you right there. You don't have to be in a fancy place. You don't have to pay nothing. It do not cost nothing. As I said, this ministry is not funded by anything but the love of Christ. So that's all we need is the love of Christ in our heart. And Jesus Christ will meet you right there. If you're tired of being on the drugs, if you want deliverance, if you, you're tired of prostitution, lying, all them things, Jesus Christ will save you and deliver you from all your sins because he died on the cross for us so if 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 if, if you're ready we just want to go through a, a few scriptures to let you know what the word of god says about how much he loves us and what he'll do for us praise the lord thank you jesus amen amen thank you lord john 3 16 for god so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loved us so much. The world, the Bible says, it rains on the just and the unjust the same way. He so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So if you think that you're beneath uh, anything, don't think like that because the Bible clearly states he loves the whole entire world. Amen. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, we, we all, we, there's two kind of people, there's saved sinners and just sinners. We all are sinners, but we are saved by God's grace and we have an opportunity to eternity. That's the difference between saved and unsaved. There's only two kind of people. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life with Christ Jesus our Lord uh, the wages of sin is death you know it's like me going to work and if I'm working on my job and at the end my payment is death I don't want it God says he has a gift that no man can earn and that's the gift of life that's his grace and that's his mercy there's nothing you have to do but accept Christ into your heart and you have a right to that gift amen that's Romans 6:23. Romans 10 9 if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved that's it there's no charge just believe it in your heart and confess it faith and belief faith and belief faith and confession that's that's the only requirements that God has asked that's Romans 10 9 Romans 10 13 for whosoever call 
on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. So there's no real, uh, whatever they might have said, there's no real, no real big theology thing here about being saved. It's just that if you're tired of doing the same thing and you want to confess your sins and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Bible says that you will be saved. That's the only requirement that we, that's required, that's the only condition on salvation. That you accept Jesus Christ and believe it, that's the con condition for salvation. Jesus Christ paid the price for us to have that put into the Bible. He put that condition because he gave his life that we might live. And we thank God for his son. We thank God that he died for us. He loved us so much. And the only thing we have to do is say yes to the Lord. The only thing we have to do is confess. We don't have to die. We don't have to go on the cross. He took all our sins into him. So if you're out there and if you want to repeat this prayer with me, the Lord will honor it and bless it just as he's done for me and everybody in this home at this time. And, we, and just repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I invite you to come into my heart. I recognize that you are my Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving my sins and forgiving, and forgiving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. For all those that said that prayer, we thank God for your salvation. We believe that somebody is going to say this prayer. When, when it's been read and we just thank God for your salvation we just gonna pray that the Lord will put you in that in that place where you will be fed the things of God and we pray that you would uh, uh, get into a Bible study um, a, a church that's preaching the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit for we can only have the whole Bible we can't have parts of the Bible so we pray for that perfect labor to be put in your path that you'll come to know the goodness of Jesus Christ as we do and we just thank the Lord for this opportunity. We thank again for our brother Norm and Kathleen for just taking time out on a Saturday morning, coming over and, and just, just taking time and give God the glory. So we pray that that ministry continue to grow and to, to do all the things that the Lord has called us to do and that he strengthen them. And I thank God for my brother Dan and I especially thank God for my wife. Praise God that will be on after me and I just thank God for this opportunity. So for all you that said the prayer, God bless and we'll see you in glory. Amen. the Lord for that wonderful message right from the heart from Moses Alexander and uh, in one minute we're gonna uh, we're gonna hear from his wife Diane and she's gonna share with us and uh, praise God for that message and I hope that this message is really speaking to your heart and uh, we just pray that uh, God's doing something in your life and we pray that you did pray that prayer with Moses and uh, we want to see you in heaven because uh, the Lord is coming soon and something that as Moses was speaking was was laid on my heart that uh, I just want to share with you uh, last night I had a dream and I dreamed that I was driving down the highway like I do every day and uh, there was a bad accident in front of me and, and I seen it and I pulled over and I was able to avoid the accident but other cars I pulled off to the shoulder of the road and other cars were flying by me and running into the cars that had just gotten the accident and some cars were uh, going really fast and so they had to slow down a lot and they were the ones that were running into the other cars and there was just like this massive pile up on the interstate and it was just a mess and I dreamed that there was this man on a motorcycle he was coming and he was going really fast way over the speed limit and he went flying into the cars and went flying and was killed and you know I just saw how terrible uh, you know why am I seeing things like this and uh, as, as the day has gone on I, I thought that uh, what God is trying to, to tell me is that uh, Moses and I and uh, what Diane is going to be sharing we've experienced things in our life that we know that Jesus Christ is the only way 
And we're, we're asking you, we're pleading with you, in Jesus' name, that you would just take our word for it, because it's written in the Bible, that uh, you have to change your life. You have to make drastic changes, some of you, and, uh, but we all have to surrender to Jesus Christ. And uh, like that man that was screaming along on a motorcycle, he was really out of control, and he really had to slow down to adjust his life. And he didn't, and a terrible thing happened. But there's still time for you. You can make changes in your life today. And I pray that you would continue to watch this broadcast and let God minister to you. Let God speak to your heart. For He created you, and He loves you. He sent His Son to die for you. So let's please really listen and hang on every word as Diane speaks to us. And uh, here now is Diane Alexander. Praise the Lord, everybody. My name is Diane Alexander. And I just want to tell you my testimony. Um, my, you just got through hearing my husband speak, uh, telling you about his life and the things that he went through. Well, I just want to tell you about me. And um, I was one of those weekend addicts. Um, my husband talk, talked to you about his addiction and the things that he went through. Well, I was one of those ones that what you could call a closet addi uh, addict, uh, someone that got high uh, with their husband. We, with my husband, we got high together. We did a lot of different drugs together. We did from um, uh, crack cocaine to cocaine heroin. Um, we did um, speed. We did acid. Those type things we did. My husband, see, I was the type of a, a addict that um, people respected because everybody didn't see me do it. Um, only my husband knew about it and only the people that we were uh, together with, you know, involved with, they seen what I did. I worked, had a good job, and on the weekends I got high. Well, we got introduced to um, crack cocaine, but before I tell you that, by me being high on different drugs, only drug I didn't like was marijuana. So when people that were on drugs got in contact with me and they had marijuana and they offered it to me, I said I didn't want it. So they figured I didn't get high. So my cover was good. So they didn't even know that I got high. So they would hide those, old, those stronger drugs. They would hide that from me. But they didn't know I was doing the same thing except the marijuana. Well, we got introduced, I think, in um, 86, we got introduced to crack cocaine. Um, I was a type of woman, and in a way still is, uh, that always wanted to be my husband's best friend. So whatever he did, I wanted to do it also so that he wouldn't have to, you know, look nowhere else because his wife could do it, you know. So I figured if he wanted to do drugs, I'd do drugs right along with him. And I remember that we didn't have much fun. We spent most of our time doing crack cocaine. And I mean, we spent hours, hours. We may start on a Friday night at uh, 7 o'clock, and it could be Sunday morning. Just continue, just so caught up in that crack cocaine. I remember the time I used to have to give my money when I got paid to my mother for, uh, for her to keep it for me so that I have rent and food and whatever. In the meantime, uh, at this time, I think I had three children. And... um. Like I said, I wanted to be my husband's best friend, so I figured you do what your husband do so that, you know, he won't have to go anywhere else. Well, what I didn't know was that my husband was unhappy, and he didn't know what he want, nor did I know what I want. So in 86, I remember, I think um, it was New Year's Eve, it just turned into 1986, and I've been to church all my life. Um, I was the type of person that I always got into a, a choir and I wanted to sing. I didn't, you know, I heard the preacher, but not really heard him, you know. Um, all I wanted to do was sing, and then after you sing, see, I went to churches where, you know, you sing, and then after you sing, you went and party afterwards. So I, I you know, I liked that kind of church. I liked that party in church afterwards. And um, I remember one day, it was coming to 96, um, New Year's Eve, and I remember just feeling a void in my life, and I was tired of the cocaine, and I was tired that me and my husband were ha we weren't having fun together. 
We didn't even know what that mean. We just wanted to get high. And you know that saying, getting sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was truly, truly just sick and tired. And I don't know, but I, I just remember that something just came in my mind and said, go to church, go to church. So um, my, by this time, me and my husband had separated, but I knew where he was. This is when he was living in abandoned buildings and places like that. So I went and found my husband. And I asked him, would he like to go to church? Now let me back up a, a, a little bit. When I met my husband over 20 something years ago, one thing that I, I liked about my husband, even though we was out in the world and we sinning and doing drugs, is that when you mention going to church, he would go. And now you know, ladies out there, you know that some of your husbands and your boyfriend won't even step into church and they don't even want you to talk about it. But my husband would go to church. So I respect that and I like that. So that I found him and let me tell you, on our way from me picking him up and going to my mother's house where, we was, where me and the kids were staying, my husband wanted to get high. Now you hear me? My husband, I'm blaming it on him. But I wanted to get high right along with him. So we went and rode around. We lived in New Jersey at that time to find cocaine, crack cocaine. And we drove around and we went to different places, but we couldn't get any crack cocaine. And by this time, I said, well, Mo, I want to go to church. So we went back, got the kids, and we went to church. And I remember at 12 o'clock, we were on our knees. We was at the altar. And I remember saying, Lord, help me. Help my family. When I picked up Mo, I told him that this is one time I just want my husband and my children, I want it all to be together. I want us all to be in church, and I want us all to be on our knees. And that's what happened. Now, some people believe that God um, don't listen to a sinner when they pray. But I believe that's a lie from the devil. Because at that altar, I asked God to help me, to help my husband and help my children, to, to, to get us off of drugs. That's what I asked. And I remember when I left there, not knowing what was going to happen. But I had a strong, just a strong desire to be in church that, that, that night. So anyway, we, we left church and from that point we would go to church like every New Year's Eve. I mean 12 o'clock, we had to be in church. So I want to talk to some of the preachers out there right now. The man of God. You know, I don't like when I hear preachers say that people go to church Christmas, they go Easter, they go Mother's Day, and special days like that. Thank God that they come in. Thank them. Stop criticizing them because they hear the word. See, you speak the word and only the word and God pl plants the seed and he increases it. Stop knocking those sisters and brothers. Maybe that's the only time they can get in. You don't know. Stop criticizing. But I knew from that one New Year's Eve that every New Year's I had to be in church. I wanted my family in church. That was in January of 96, and wasn't long after that I got off of drugs. Not like my husband, I didn't have to go to um, Narcotics Anonymous or anything like that. What I did was, I was at home and, you know, I said, well, at this time me and my husband are separated, and I said, well, um, I can just get high on my birthday, you know, because we grew up that way. We grew up with parents that on Christmas, they got drunk and they cook. On Thanksgiving, they got drunk and they cook. So that's what you, you thought. You know, your birthday, you celebrate. And I remember something just saying to me, no, it's not good to do drugs on your birthday or no other day. And I just didn't pick up anymore. I didn't want to do drugs anymore. Um, I thank God for my husband because he has taught me a lot of things. We have been a lot of places. We have been in areas of gunshots. We have been in areas of uh, abandoned buildings and people shooting drugs into their, their, their neck. We have been places where we could have been dead, where no one would even know where we were at. But thank God for his grace and his mercy. He always kept, kept us from harm. Uh, my husband um, got saved before I did, ladies. Um, what happened was, after he went into the hospital and as he told you that he, uh, they couldn't find out what was wrong with him, 
And in the meantime, what he forgot to tell you, each day seemed like he was losing weight more and more and more and more each day. He was so small when he, when he left out of the hospital. But I didn't know that he was wrestling with God or anything like that. And as he said, we have a pastor who at that time wasn't our pastor, but would come up there and, and pray for my husband. And um, one day, um, my husband just started going to church right after the, uh, him being in the hospital. He just started going to church. And he used to ask me to go with him, and I wouldn't go. Uh, my husband and my kids would go, and they'll come back. And my youngest at that time, Monique, would say, Mom, you sent us to church, and you, are ne and you don't never go. What's wrong with you? And they would, you know, say those things. And my mother and father was going to church. And um, my husband mentioned to you about my old, our oldest son. At that time, he was going to church, to a different church. But Diane wasn't going to nobody's church. I didn't want to hear about no church. I didn't want to hear about God. I, I just wasn't going to do it. So my husband got to a point he just stopped asking me. He didn't argue about it. He just stopped asking me. He would get dressed on Sundays. The kids would get dressed. And they would go to church. And he just kept doing that. Well, okay, the devil came in. You know, and I'm saying now, my husband going to church a little bit too much here. There's, there's something wrong. He never went to church before. I went to church to fight. Now let me tell you what I went to church for. I went to church to see if my husband was messing around with some woman in church. That's why Diane went to church. So I went to church with bad motives. I went to church to fight in church. Whoever it may be, I went looking for her. Well anyway, I got in church and the preacher spoke the word and the anointing was there. And I got saved. I got saved. See how the devil would try to take a bad situation or and have you think all kinds of madness and God used that to save me and from that point on I've been in church ever since but yes ladies I went there to fight I went to go and find out what's going on with my husband okay so I got saved now like I said before I've been in and out of churches up until I was about 15 years old and I, I used to join people church I'll join your church tomorrow and at that time, I'd be sincere, but all I really wanted to do was get in the choir. But this particular time was something different. When I went down that aisle, I wasn't joining the church building. It just seemed like, I don't know, it just seemed like I seen, seen the Lord with his arms stretched out and just telling me to come on. And I felt, truly felt like I was joining him, not the building. And what happened was, um, right after I, got, I, um, I, I received Christ as my Savior, I was standing there. People were shaking your hand and everything like that. And um, what I would do is join a choir, but I, I didn't. I hadn't sung a song since I was 15 years old. I had been with my husband and had all, three children at the time. And no one had ever heard me sing. I just stopped completely singing because I couldn't sing. I had, I had no joy and I had no peace. I didn't even hum a song. I just didn't do it. So I was standing there and wondering, what is next? What do I do next? And something said, get into my word. I didn't know at that time when I received Christ as my Savior that the Holy Spirit entered in. But he said, get into my word. And I was saying, well, how can I do that? Who could teach me the word of God? And he um, told me Reverend Captola Bowling. So my husband went to her and asked her about having Bible study. And we start going and getting into his word. And I truly heard the message that when Jesus Christ died on that cross and took our sins. I remember sitting around the table, it had to be about six or seven of us. And just loving God so much and said, he really did that for me. He really cared that much for me. See, God loves you when you don't even love yourself. I remember thinking times back, I had no feeling. I mean, I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel happy. I didn't feel sad. I just didn't feel. Now, I know some of you ladies and any you men out there are in that situation right now. You just don't have a feeling. You don't know what, what you feel. And that's where I was at. My husband testified to you that... Um, that um, he, um, that I was a single parent because of the drugs and things that he was doing. Well, in, in him being on drugs and, and me taking care of the, the children, 
I got this manly spirit about me. I had to be hard. I thought hard. I lost my, um, my feminine. I just, it just lost it, you know? I was smoking cigarettes and things like that before I got saved. And, uh, and I just had this hardness about me. And when my husband got saved and, and just started showing the love of Christ, I still had this hardness. And he, he would just show God. He would just show his love, you know, and he would just say nice things to me. I couldn't accept them because all I could think about was the past and the hardness that was in my heart. I was truly hard. I mean, I just, I even that kind of manly, I think, at that time, you know. But I got in the word of God and the word, it just started cleansing me. And it started making me stop cursing. It stopped making me think bad thoughts. It start making me feel good about myself. It start making me have closer relationship with the Lord. It showed me that whatever I'm going through, I can just ask God to help me. Just help me. And I was just so amazed at God's love. And you really need to get into God's word. You really need to know him. And see how much he loved us so much. Well, I got into his word. And I remember people saying, um, our pastor would say that I was called to evan be an evangelist. And my husband was called to be a pastor. And it was about five of us around the table at that time. Which we didn't believe it. I remember her telling me, well, the Holy Spirit told me, you're going to sing for the Lord again. I hadn't sung in so many years. I didn't believe that neither. Well, today is true. After getting into his word, I realized uh, that that was a gift from God. And all that I found out that he did for me, I just wanted to glorify him. So I asked God, if he'd give me that gift back, I'll sing for his glory. I'll sing on the street corner. I'll sing wherever he want me to sing. I'll do that. And I'll go wherever he want me to go. See, the God that we serve is a living God. He's alive and he is real. Hallelujah. And I know some of you brothers and sisters out there are confused. Because you're so confused with religion. And you're confused with people in church buildings. Who tell you how to act, what to think, and what to do, and what not to do. But that's not of God. Everything God do is out of love. Hallelujah. And a true believer is going to speak to you in love. And they're not going to give you their opinions, what they think about what's going on in your life. They'll give you the word of God. Because God magnified his word above his name. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away. But his life and his word will last forever. And it's true. I've seen what the word of God has done in my life and a lot of people's life. Well, I used to smoke, and I remember when my husband, he was the first one to get saved. He was the first one to stop smoking. And I remember him going to church, like I said, and I wasn't going to church. And I was still smoking my cigarettes. And my husband never complained. He didn't say a word. I'll just smoke, just being rebellious, huh? He's not going to tell me what to do. And I'll just smoke just because, just to be mean to him. And I remember one night, I went to sleep. And it must have been about 5 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning. And I had this dream and I didn't see a face. I just heard this voice that said, If you continue to smoke, you are going to die. And I jumped up out of my dream. I woke up. I was so afraid. I got up and I went downstairs. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. And I just sat in the chair. I was scared to go to sleep. Because that dream was so real. It said if I continue to smoke, I was going to die. So around 5 o'clock, I went upstairs and I woke my husband up because it was time for him to go to, um, to work. And I asked him, what did he do to stop smoking? And he used to buy a bag of uh, mint candy and he used to suck on that. And um, I had one cigarette left in my pack. And of course, you know, the flesh is weak. I lit up that cigarette and as I took two puffs, I remember that dream and I put it in the toilet and praise God I haven't smoked cigarettes since. And I believe that that was truly the Lord speaking to me. 
And he delivered me. He took the desire, the desire of cigarette smoking away from me. My husband talked to you about the 12-step program, and I'm not going to knock it. But I didn't need that. But God is the God that can deliver you. He'll take the taste, he'll take the desire of drugs away from you. You can go to all the programs you want. And some people go year after year after year. And they come right back out and they um, take drugs again. Or they drink alcohol or whatever. They continue to be, continue to use. But if you will ask God to come into your life, ask him to deliver you, to take the desire from He will take the desire away from you. Where you could be in a place where they smoke. Or where they even do drugs and you wouldn't even have a desire to even want it. Only God can do that. I know you're out there and saying, well, I got to get myself together before I can receive Christ as my Savior. But there's nothing you can do. All you can do is receive Him. God will do the cleaning up. You stop trying to be God. You stop trying to get yourself together. Because you'll never get yourself together. You'll go deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. Because we're not qualified. We can't do it. That's why Jesus died on that cross for us. That's why he rose for us. Hallelujah. To set us free. We can't do it. And you know I'm talking to you. I don't know who I'm talking to. But you know I'm talking to you. You done tried many things. But you haven't tried God. We hear so many. You know we, we go door to door. And we knock on the door to people. And they ask them about the Lord. And they have all these uh, different ideals about Christ and uh, about the church. And a lot of people here in West Michigan, I'm going to let you know, I'm from New Jersey. I've been here a year. But a lot of people in West Michigan, they go to church. And when you knock on the door and you ask them, do they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? And they say, well, I went to such and such in church. I go to such and such in church. Well, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about having a real relationship with Christ. We are talking about speaking to God. We are talking about Him speaking back to you. We are talking about loving Him and worshiping Him. See, some of you ladies out there got these men, and you worship them. You admire them, and you make them your God. But you're not happy. You're not happy. You need to try Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to hear no more about what Reverend Dewicky did, or... Uh, elder so and so. I don't want to hear about the deacons or the people in the church what they did. Your example of a true Christian is Jesus Christ. Pick up the word of God. Pick up his word. When you pick up the word of God, he will teach you about him. And he will also teach you about you. You'll know what your purpose is in life. See, God didn't make you to come and do whatever you want to do. God made you to worship and praise you. He made you in his image. Amen. So you, you, you need to get into his word. It's time church people. And I'm talking to the church members now. That, that go to church every Sunday. It's time for you to get off of those pews. Get out of those seats. And hit those streets. It's time for you to get out there and tell people that you serve a true living God. It's time for you to tell them that Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. See, to every answer, to every problem, there is an answer. And that answer is Jesus. It's not in Farrakhan. It's not in Buddhist. It's not in Jehovah Witness. It's in none of those things. It's in the true and living God, Jesus. And the reason why you're talking about you don't want to know is because you haven't known him. God said, try him. You don't have to take my word while you're sitting there. Try him. Say, Lord, if you're real, show me you're real. And he'll do it right now. He'll do it right now for you. You don't have to guess about God, you know. And there's nothing you really can do but just receive him and ask him to make you become the woman or man that he has called you to be, that he has created you to be. See, God has a perfect plan for everyone's life. You're not here by a coincidence. You're not here because of, of um, just a sexual pleasure. You're not here because your parents just wanted to have a child or your mother just wanted a, a, a child or whatever. You're not here for that. You're here to worship and praise God, to serve Him. And I'm telling you, we serve a true living God who sits on the right hand of God the Father, who's praying for us right now. Who's praying for you right now? See, this is not a coincidence that you're watching. It's not a coincidence that um, I'm um, speaking to you. 
This is a, a, a day that was ordained by God. Before the foundation of the earth. He knew on this day that you will be listening. So you know when you die, you can't tell God I didn't know. You can't tell God you didn't hear. God give everybody a chance to receive his son. He gives everybody a chance. You remember that time when they knocked on your door? You remember that time when you was in the grocery store? Do you remember that time when you was at the gas station and somebody gave you a, a, a flyer? Do you remember that? Do you remember that time when you cut on the radio and you heard the word of God? Do you remember when you sat in that office and you looked over there and you seen somebody reading their Bible? Do you remember those times? See, when that day come and you die and you stand before God, you won't have any reason to say you didn't know. Because God gave you an opportunity. Before, he, before you leave this earth, he gave you an opportunity. He have his saints come past you, come by your house, come where you're at to receive him. So he give you a chance. And yes, I mean, no, there's nothing that you can do but receive him. I'm going to tell you something. You have watched Christians that say they are Christians and they live their life any old kind of way. A true believer, God said, you'll know them by their fruits. They won't be judgmental. They will speak the word of God and they will love you. They won't try to get over on you. So you really need to get in the words so that you'll know who a true Christian is, a true believer. Because they'll have the fruit of the Spirit. See, it's the Holy Spirit that keeps us and make us become Christians. That keep us from falling to temptation. It's nothing that a man could do or a woman. God said it's not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit. Amen. And how you can re receive that Spirit is by receiving Christ into your life. He's the true example of a Christian. He came to this earth and he never sinned. So don't look at your preacher. Don't look at the teacher. Don't look at man or woman to find out how it is to be a Christian. Look at Jesus. He's the true example. And Jesus is the answer to every problem that you have. And you know what? There's no problem too small. There's no problem too big. All you got to do is just ask him to help you. And even if you don't believe it, you got a little doubt in you right now. Say, Lord, help me to believe you. Show yourself to me. Just try him. I guarantee you. There's no better way. I would live no other life without Christ. I would not even, can't even think about living another way. I'm so thankful. When I read his word and it tells me how much he loves me and what he did for me. How can someone love you that much? That God the Father sent his only son. That his son was willing to take our sins. And I'm going to tell you something. If you can't believe that Christ died on that cross for your sin, then you're going to have to pay for that sin. Are you ready? Are you willing to pay for your sins? That's death. That's in hell. And yes, there's hell. And I don't care what you believe. I don't care if you believe hell is on this earth. But it's not. There is a hell. And if you don't receive Christ as your Savior, that's exactly where you're going. And yes, I'm talking to you, Mr. and Mrs. Niceness. Mr. and Mrs. Good. Been good all your life. If you haven't received Christ as your Savior, you're going straight to hell. I'm talking to you, church member, that been going to church every year and been on every kind of um, program that they have. Even the ones that's been sitting in the pulpit and saying you've been called by God. And you know that you don't even have a relationship with God. I'm talking to you. If you don't receive Christ as your Savior and repent from your sins, you're going to hell. I don't care how much gifts you give out, how much money you, you give to people, how much you feed the poor, how much you clothe the poor, how much you invite them to your house. If you don't receive Christ as your Savior, you're going to hell. There is a place called hell. And you don't have to go there because God today right now is giving you an opportunity to receive him into your life. He's there. He's knocking on your heart right now. Won't you let him in? Why don't you just let him in? I'm telling you this. I get emotional. I cry. But I'm so thankful that I can have teardrops. I'm so thankful to know the love of God. I am so thankful. Because I could have been one dead in hell. I surely did a lot of things to be in hell. And I, you know... I'm talking to you out there, man or woman, 
boy and girl. You think about your life. You think about your friends that are dead. You think about people that you know that are dead. That did the same exact things with drugs and they're dead. I think about that actor River, River Phoenix. I remember one time they had it on the news that he was dead. He had did all these different drugs and stuff and he just got up and went out the door and he fell dead. And I remember it was my husband and my uh, sister-in-law and my brother. We were all sitting at the table. And uh, some of them were saying, that's a shame. And the Lord just had me think about that. And you know what I thought about? I thought about the times that we did the same exact thing. And we're here today. We did the same exact thing. How many of you out there has did cocaine and heroin and took all kinds of stuff and drink alcohol and beer and all night and all day and you're alive. Do you know why? Because it's only the grace of God. It's only His will for you to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. That He give you another day, another opportunity. How about when the bullets were sh shooting past you, just missed you, or even got you in the arm? It could have went in your heart. Think about it. Don't take life for granted. Tomorrow's not promised to anyone. Receive him now as your savior. And you won't regret it. Yes, you will have some bad days. But you know what? That makes it so much better. The word of God tells me that he'll never leave me and he'll never forsake me. And I can stand on that word. When he tells me that when trials come in my life, I can get on my knees. Or I don't have to get on my knees. I could be driving in my car. I could be cooking in the kitchen. And I could say, Jesus, help me. See, that's what he wants. He wants us to trust him. He is God. We're not. There's nothing we can do. He is God. He's Lord of Lords and He's Kings of Kings. Amen. Let him into your heart. Let him into your heart. He'll clean you up. He'll deliver you. He'll set you free. Listen no longer to the devil. See, I know he's in your mind right now telling you things, telling you that, hey, click that station. Sure, he don't want you to be set free. He still wants you to be caught up in your addiction. He wants you to be caught up in your playing, Kristen. He wants that. But you can be set free. We rebuke the devil. God said if we resist the devil, he will flee. See, God's word is like a two-edged sword. If you repeat those words of God back to the devil, he'll flee. Amen? And his word will encourage you. And, he'll, and it'll heal you. It, it, it will heal all those past hurts, those emotions. Ladies, if you've been raped, if you've been hurt in any kind of way. And also you men. They don't talk about much of you men being raped and hurt. But you are being abused. Man... You'll never know how to have a relationship with a woman, nor a woman will you ever know how to have a relationship with man if you don't know to have a relationship with God. Because God is the one that teaches you how to have a relationship with one another. He is the one that shows you how to man to be a man, woman to be a woman, to be that mother, to be that daughter. God is the one that, that, that shows that to us. And that's why you go from relationship to a, from one relationship to another. Because you don't know how to be a woman and you don't know how to be a man. But if you let God come into your life he, and start studying his word. Because God said if you abide in him, he'll abide in you. And you start studying his word, then you'll learn more about being you. Amen. God is truly great. I love him. You know, and, and I don't mind telling you. My husband said that um, we go door to door, and we surely do. So if you haven't seen us, you will see us. We will knock on your door. And when we go, we go with holy boldness. We go with the anointing of God. There's nothing that we do. It's all about God. I used to say to people, bring the biggest, the baddest, the roughest, and the toughest. Because there's nothing that we do. We're just going to stand there and watch God. Work in your life. Amen. Watch God deliver you. Come on, bad, tough guy. Come on. 
You know that, that image that you like to, to bring, you young people? You know that image that you like to bring? We know that you're hurting inside. We know that you need direction, you need guidance. You may not be getting that at home, but it's not too late for you. If you invite Jesus into your life, he can just help you, he can just heal you. He can make you to be a beautiful, beautiful person because that's what he created you to be. There's no such thing as peer pressure, neither young people. That's a lie from the devil, okay? Because you should be able to communicate with your parents. There's no such thing as peer pressure. It's the devil playing tricks with your mind and it's that rebellious spirit. That's what it is. I know some of you out there don't believe in demons, okay? You know, of course you don't believe in the devil. But he would have it that way for you not to believe, for you to pretend that you don't believe. But Christ said that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers in darkness. That's what the word of God said. So you don't know that. And I'm going to tell you something, parents. You get on your children, you get mad with them, and you cuss at them. Well, let me tell you what you're doing. You're putting a curse on them. Every time you curse at them, you're putting a curse on them. And you wonder why they turn out the way they are. You wonder why they disrespect you. The word of God said, train them up in the way they go. And when they get old, they won't de depart. Amen? So you need to know that. You need to know that your behavior, your words, God said out of your, your words, could come blessings or cursing. So when you're cursing at your children, you're not blessing them. Don't think no good things are going to happen. You're putting a curse on your child. And let me get to you, children, teenagers, young people. God said for you to honor your mother and father with a promise that you will ha uh, live long on earth. That's the promise. You think about some of your friends that are dead. How do they treat their parents? And you know what? The word of God said for us to be submissive to one another. So you don't have to worry about changing your parents and changing if they're on drugs or whatever. Pray for them. Pray and trust and believe that God can work that situation out. Believe that God can change your mother, can change your father, can change your cousin, whoever it may be, your neighbor. Give them to God. Let it go. Let it go. And let God. Amen. Because there's nothing you can do. But if you praise and pray and seek him, God will do all the changing. It's time for us to stop trying to play God. I know some of y'all have been taught that you are God, but that's a lie from the devil. You're not God. It's time for you to give your life to Christ. It's time for church members to, to get up off those seats and get out into them streets. Because God sent his disciples. He sent them out. He said, go. And when Jesus came... He went out. The people didn't come to him. He went out. And I realize, church people, you're going to get kind of mad with me because, you know, we got these nice pretty buildings and everybody's supposed to come in. Well, you know what? I heard a joke one time that um, this guy was looking for the devil. And what he did is um, he went in the bars. He couldn't find the devil. He went in the crack house. He couldn't find the devil. He went um, on the street corners. He couldn't find the devil. So you know the guy said, well, look, I'm tired. So he went into this church and he sat down and boom, there go was the devil sitting right there in the church. It's time to get out of those churches. It's time to be a true believer of God. It's, try, it's time to, to stand on his word. It's time for you to stop compromising. And you've been doing that. I'm talking to these Christian people. Being a Christian means to be Christ-like. It doesn't mean to go to church on Sundays. And pretend. And then live your life any old raggedy way. It means to be Christ-like. It means to live holy. God said, be ye holy for I am holy. It's time for you to stop compromising. It's time for you to stop saying because people believe in different things. And, 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 you, and you just stand there and you keep your mouth shut or, or you agree with them. It's time for you to stop doing that. And stand on the word of God. And let them know the God that you serve. And the God that they're serving is the God, the devil. And he's not God. It's time for you Christian men and sisters and brothers to get out and tell somebody about Jesus. Stop compromising. Doesn't matter on your job if they don't want to hear about Christ. 
God said that if you're ashamed of him, he's going to be ashamed of you. Let him know who you are and, and, and what you stand for. Don't compromise. You don't have to listen to those nasty jokes any longer. You don't have to listen to people when they just say Jesus' name in vain. You let them know. You let them know about Jesus. Stop compromise. I, can't, I just can't stop saying that. Stop compromise. It's time to stop that. It's time for you to stop pretending that you're a Christian. Let us see the love of Christ. People are hurting out there, you know. People are dying out there. People are committing suicide. And you know what? Jehovah Witnesses are out there every day. And they're taking time with people. And they're finding out what their needs are. And they're listening to people. But we're Christians. We're hiding in our houses. And we're scared to go out in different areas. If it's not the nice, pretty, quiet areas. That's not of God. And you're going to be held accountable for it, Christians. You're going to be held accountable. Don't think you're getting over. Because one day you're going to see Jesus. And he's going to ask you why you didn't go. Again, I, I love the Lord. I can talk about him all day. I do love him. Because he, he's done a lot of things for me in my life. So, I'm just going to leave you with this song. For you Christians that um, get a little discouraged. It goes like this. Why should I feel? Discouraged And why Should those shadows come Why should my heart Feel low and lonely And wondering For my heavenly home When Jesus is my portion the constant friend is he his his eyes is on a sparrow and i know he watches me and if he care about a sparrow, he cares about you. Amen. Well, I don't know. I'm kind of speechless here, which is um, <laughs> uh, a miracle for me to be speechless. Uh, I usually don't have a loss for words. But um, as we bring this broadcast to a close, uh, I am awestruck at how God has spoken through Brother Dan Van Hoven, through Brother Moses Alexander and his precious wife, Diane. If you had the opportunity to watch the beginning of this broadcast, I am convinced beyond all doubt that God has been speaking some powerful things to a whole bunch of people on this broadcast. To him, we are thankful for doing so. And as I've been uh, behind the camera, just trying to hear what God would have uh, us to do as we end out this precious testimonies broadcast, I think there's a couple of things that somebody is supposed to hear before we run out of time. Um, if you've noticed the tears that have been running down Moses and Diane's eyes, you want to know what the Holy Spirit looks like. You want to know what the Holy Spirit looks like? Well, that was symbolic of what the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, looks like. Flowing like a river, the river of life flowing out of human eyes wasn't coincidence all those tears were running those are tears of sorrow of compassion of hurt and pain because the Holy Spirit knows of the multitudes that might be hearing what was said just a few perhaps just you would respond to those tears and tears maybe would come out of your eyes and they may be tears of sorrow for a season but ultimately would be tears of joy I've never thought of that. 
I don't know. I, I don't know if that is a revelation for somebody, but those tears is what the Holy Spirit looks like. It's what God looks like, at least in a small way. Something else maybe far more important than that. Some of you heard that God has a plan. He has a purpose for your life. And I felt the Holy Spirit wanted somebody to know the plan that God has for every human being that will ever be born on this life, His ultimate plan is that you come to know and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Friend, you can feed millions. You can give billions and trillions to the work of whatever. But friend, <laughs> If you've never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you have lived your whole lifetime, however long that might be, and you've missed the entire purpose of you living your life. There's no greater plan, no greater purpose. God wants you to know His plan, first and foremost, is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And once that has happened, and you speak with reverence and awe when you mention the name of Jesus, where tears can come down your eyes, down your face, when you mention about this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Words can't describe it. You can only experience it. And as you grow in that experience, then God will begin to reveal to you what He wants you to do with your gifts, your talent, your time, your treasure. Then He will lead you to help others who don't know that having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the plan that God wants everybody to walk into. Only a few do. Many reject it. We don't have all of the answers. God does. We don't understand why God has allowed little innocent babies to die before they even have a chance to know. We can't answer all of the reasons why God continues to allow. I'm sure it's in His mercy. I'm sure it's within reasons that we human beings wouldn't fully understand why He allows young people to die before they have a chance. But God has provision for those people. We're not concerned about those people as much as we're concerned about those that are alive whose heart has not stopped yet. That, my friend, is you. You're going to stand before God. Let me just end this out by reading, I don't have time. We are going to have to bring this to a close. My friend, if you've been touched in any way, give God the glory. His name, Jesus Christ. To Him be all the glory, the praise, and the honor. Because, friend, He died for you. He died just for you. Scripture says He was fully God. He always was God. He always will be God. Second person of the Godhead. But God died for you. He didn't have to. He chose to do so. Someday, if you disbelieve that now, someday when you stand before this Jesus Christ, and you will, and you will bow before him and say he truly is Lord. Maybe not your Lord, but he is Lord. You will understand fully who this one was that died on that cross, paid the painful price that you might have life, and life more abundantly in a relationship. Now, this moment with him, friend, it's worth everything. Thank you. God bless you.